got $10,000 for one fish? From the open seas, to the cannery, to the school lunchbox. It's the fish that means so much to so many. Powerfully built, they're sleek and they're fast. If there ever was a sexy fish, this is it. But due to overfishing, the most prized of their species is in trouble. Wherever they swim, they're the most sought after fish in the world. Today, people across the globe are working to save these ocean giants. But can they be bred in captivity? Now, it's Tuna on Modern Marvels. Every morning in seaports and fishing villages throughout the world, fishermen are gearing up, collecting bait, and heading out. All with the same goal in mind, reeling in that most powerful and delectable of fish, tuna. Among the anglers are pole and troll fishers in the North Pacific longliners off Hawaii, and purse saners in the Mediterranean. In an average year, nearly four million tons of tuna are hauled aboard ship. That's almost one and a half pounds for every man, woman, and child on Earth, making it the most popular food fish in the world. What most people think of tunas is as a tuna sandwich. Well, actually, these are magnificent creatures, but people don't know about them. The tuna is probably the best designed fish in the world. If you had to design something that was perfect at moving through the water, you would end up designing a tuna. The name tuna is derived from the Greek verb tuno, meaning rush, which is appropriate given the tuna's remarkable swimming ability. Bullet-shaped and built for speed and distance, some species have been clocked at more than 50 miles per hour. When tuna swim rapidly, their fins retract into grooves, and even their eyes form a smooth surface with the rest of the head. Tuna are found in all major bodies of water, except the polar seas. These nomads roam incredibly long distances, often making transoceanic migrations in a matter of weeks. Like sharks, tuna never rest. Their demand for oxygen requires swimming one body length per second. Some species, such as the bluefin, are warm-blooded, enabling them to maintain a body temperature slightly higher than the surrounding water. This added heat gives an extra boost to their already powerful muscles. Tunas are the most remarkable bony fish in all of the sea. There's over 20,000 species of fish, and tunas are the pinnacle of bony fish evolution. There are at least a dozen species of tuna. They range in size from the canning tunas, such as albacore and skipjack, to the largest and fastest of them all, the bluefin. We call it the Porsche of the oceans. This is an animal that is as big as a Porsche. They get up to 1,500 pounds. It's as fast as a Porsche. These are incredibly hydrodynamic, very amazing animals in, in the wild. And it's as expensive as a Porsche, with uh, one animal going for more than $100,000. All species of tuna are predators, often feeding on smaller schooling fishes. They're near the top of the food chain, with few natural enemies. Tunas do have predators. They'll be fed on by large sharks and Probably one of their most voracious predators are us, we humans. The tuna may be blessed with a dynamic nature, but it's surprisingly easy to catch. The Portuguese and Italian fishers who came to America in the early 1900s brought with them one of the earliest methods, known as jack poling. A century later, an independent collection of families out of San Diego still practice this technique. They catch, can, and distribute their own brand, American tuna. 
This type of fishing right here is sport fishing on steroids. It's the pinnacle of it. This technique is a 100-year-old technique. This is how the tuna industry started. Every year from June to November, Jack Webster and his fellow fishers comb the waters of the Pacific where the albacore are biting. Their equipment is minimal. So I have a 10-foot pole here with about a six-foot piece of line on it. The stainless steel wire and the jig, that's all you have. Tracking the tuna is part fish sense. Recognizing telltale signs, such as the presence of seabirds, and part electronic. The boat is equipped with a depth sounder that uses sound waves to detect fish beneath the craft, sonar which can track them in front of the boat or on either side, and satellite imaging. Albacore, a white meat tuna, is a tempered water fish, meaning it's going to be in latitudes in the world's oceans that are in cooler water. Call it surface temperatures from 58 degrees to 66 degrees. Skipjack and yellowfin tuna are going to be in warmer water, tropical or subtropical waters. So you'd say the temperature of the water would be from 68 to 85 degree water. Once the fishers have located a school, a designated chummer begins tossing live bait, usually anchovies or sardines, to attract the tuna. The jack polers descend into steel racks to get as close to the water as possible. There's a foothold right here where you're gonna put your right foot over it. You want this rail on the rack right here where your knee's gonna hit it. One foot back to keep your balance. You put the squid in the water. This is, has an artificial tail on it. And this is what you'd be doing to give it a little action. When the fish bites, you make a V-shape here. This arm goes right down to the pad to get the butt of the pole in the pad. This arm goes forward. The fish is on the hook. You got both hands on it. Throw it up, and it's on the deck. Then back in the water. Jack polers bring in their fish one at a time, always throwing the catch over their right shoulder. The hook is specially designed for a quick release. This hook is like an L-shaped. It's not a full hook. And what happens is, when you got to keep steady pressure on it, when the fish is coming up over your head, you give it a little bit of slack, it'll fall out of the fish's mouth, and the fish will fall on the deck. Then you can go back in the water. The Jack Polar's boat can hold up to 55 tons of tuna. Outstanding, man. Good job, boys. A brine solution freezes the fish before they're hauled on shore. Yeah, at times, we feel like a, a, a dinosaur. One of the biggest questions I get from the public at large is, is that they can't believe that we still do this. Myself, I'm absolutely happy with what I do, and I'm at peace with it. Tuna fisheries around the world harvest hundreds of thousands of tons of albacore. Our fishery in the North Pacific averages 10,000. So we're a fraction of the total picture of tuna harvested. In fact, jack polling accounts for less than 5% of the world tuna catch. Today, factory-sized commercial vessels catch the vast majority of tuna, using one of two methods. The first is longline fishing. This method uses thousands of baited hooks attached to extremely long fishing lines, some of them extending 40 to 50 miles. Longlining accounts for about 14% of the world's total tuna catch. Although it's very effective at catching tuna, longlining pulls in many non-targeted species as well. Longlines particularly have a high level of concern for us uh, because of the bycatch of sharks, turtles, and seabirds. The second method is purse seining. It involves laying out a purse-shaped net, or seine, in a wide circle around a school of fish. By pulling a cable through weighted rings at the bottom of the net, the fishers draw the seine into a purse, closing off the bottom and capturing the catch inside. The massive net can entrap and hold up to 3,000 tuna in a single toss. Purse seining accounts for roughly 60% of all the tuna landed. It also produces a significant bycatch, most notably dolphins, since they often swim above schools of yellowfin tuna. 
from the late 1950s, when commercial fishermen first began purseining, until the early 1970s, an estimated 350,000 dolphins died each year in purse seines. But with technological advances such as escape hatches for the dolphins and passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, that number has been dramatically reduced. Still, thousands of dolphins are killed annually in this practice. We can't afford to rape and pillage the oceans just for a tuna sandwich. We need to get away from long lining, purse these destructive methods of fishing in favor of more selective methods of fishing like hook and line and so forth. California's Monterey Bay Aquarium has taken an active role in educating the public about fishing practices. Its seafood watch program is designed in part to help consumers identify which fish are caught by sustainable methods and which are not. The aquarium also houses the only exhibit in North America that includes bluefin and yellowfin tuna. Eleven different species share the million-gallon tank. But the bluefin, each weighing several hundred pounds, are clearly the stars. They inspire awe among our visitors. They love seeing these tunas in a tank that simulates what they look like in the wild. It's not an animal you'll see in captivity too often. It, it does require a little extra care and handling. They're warm-bodied, so they have these really high metabolic rates, and so they have these big appetites. In the wild, blue fins attain their enormous size by gorging themselves on fish, crustaceans, squid, and eel. In the aquarium, four times a week, they feast on 25 pounds of sardines, 40 pounds of squid, and 15 pounds of a vitamin-rich gel. Tunas are a little picky. They usually don't take the gel as well, so we'll tend to feed the gel and the squid first. And they really like the sardines, so we'll feed the sardines last after we make sure they get all the nutrients and vitamins they need in the gel food. The tuna at the Monterey Bay Aquarium will never end up on anyone's dinner plate. But these will. They're part of America's love affair with canned tuna, where canneries like this turn out numbers that stagger the imagination. Tuna is the most widely consumed fish in the American diet. Whether it's cooked on a grill, made into a sandwich, or sliced for sashimi, the average American eats nearly three pounds of it every year. Most of it is canned. We eat a billion pounds of canned and pouched tuna every year. That's more than a third of the total seafood consumed in the US. Surprisingly, America's tuna industry began quite by accident in 1903. In the early 20th century, tuna weren't caught very often and weren't canned very often. And the story is told that a sardine fisherman, unable to catch enough sardines to uh, support his own cannery, uh, caught some albacore, caught some smaller tuna, and canned them, and they became very popular throughout America. Suddenly, they found something else that Americans would eat. Within a decade, nine plants were in operation along the Pacific coast producing 115,000 cases annually. During the First World War, American doughboys in Europe needed a convenient protein-rich food, and canned tuna proved a perfect solution. By the 1950s, the U.S. had become the largest producer and consumer of canned tuna products. One of the earliest canneries, and the only major tuna cannery still operating in America, is Bumblebee. The company originally started as a canner of salmon products. By probably 1940, 1945, the company moved to a canner of tuna as a predominant line offering to consumers. Here in this Santa Fe Springs, California cannery, tuna is the only fish on the menu. Lots of it. 
facility is the most efficient in the world. We run 200 tons of fish every single day. We put 40,000 cases out the door, so fish comes in one door and 40,000 cases goes out the next every single day. Bumblebee tuna comes from waters throughout the world, including Southeast Asia. The catch consists of albacore, skipjack, big eye, and yellowfin. All of our albacore is long line caught, which means every fish is individually caught on a hook. Our skipjack, big eye, yellowfin is all per se. By the time it reaches the US, it's in frozen slabs wrapped in plastic. That's after being headed, tailed, cooked, and deboned in overseas processing plants. So here in the United States, we're not dealing with the whole fish, we're dealing with the loin bag. That loin bag contains the fillets of the fish. That's what we put into the cans. Before being canned, the tuna must be thawed. That takes place inside of Bumblebee's uniquely designed thaw tunnel. What goes in frozen solid comes out at 50 to 55 degrees. Then it's off to the fillers, seven separate lines operating 24-7. Some are designed to run albacore or white tuna, while others process light tuna, made mostly from skipjack. The fillers are programmed to pack five ounce steel cans with either chunk tuna made up of smaller pieces, or the larger pieced solid variety. Each filler can handle as many as 600 cans per minute. Two million cans, two million of those little five ounce cans that you see in the grocery store every day. Then it's time to add liquid, whether it's oil, a vegetable broth, or just plain water. What we find is here in the United States, folks would much rather have their product in water. In Europe, it's a different story. They would prefer their product in oil. The filled cans then pass along the assembly line to a seamer, where they're vacuum sealed. The seamer dispenses lids, or ends, at a rate of anywhere from 100 to 800 cans a minute. Powerful magnetic elevators then transport the sealed cans into large metal baskets. These baskets are loaded 12 at a time, into giant pressure cookers, known as retorts, where the fish is cooked and sterilized. Each retort can cook up to 12,000 cans at a time. We have nine retorts that we load our product into. We run it up to between 230 and 240 degrees for about two hours, and then it's cooked and ready to go. After cooling, the cans pass through an x-ray machine that checks for bones or metals. Only then will they be fed into the labeler, which slaps the familiar Bumblebee logo on the cans. All Bumblebee cans also bear the Dolphin Safe label. These labels can be traced to 1990, when the world's three largest tuna companies, Starkist, Bumblebee, and Chicken of the Sea, agreed to stop purchasing, processing, and selling tuna caught by intentional chasing and netting of dolphins. We have the National Marine Fishery release and that is a sign off from the captain that says that there's been no dolphin caught with that fish. Bumblebee ranks number two nationwide in total sales, next to Starkist, accounting for roughly 31% of the market. And while sales of canned tuna have been on a general decline over the past decade, there has been a spike during the recent economic crisis, as more and more people began bringing their lunch to work. Canned tuna is the only regularly consumed seafood at lunch. In fact, of those Americans who eat canned tuna, the vast majority, 83%, eat it as their midday meal. Tuna for generations has been one of those wholesome family experiences. It's versatile, it's delicious, it's loaded with incredible health benefits. Those benefits include high protein, low fat, and a rich source of omega-3 fatty acids that have been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease. What we're learning today is consumers just aren't getting enough fish in their diet. While eating tuna does have enormous health benefits, consumers should be aware of some guidelines. 
Tuna are predators, and so we see that they do feed on a variety of other animals, smaller fishes, squids, and a lot of toxins that might be present in animals that they're feeding on, like mercury, can be passed up the food chain to these tunas. For most people, the risk from mercury by eating fish is not a concern. However, the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency do recommend that women who may become pregnant or are pregnant, nursing mothers and young children, should limit their consumption to 12 ounces a week of a variety of fish, including those that are lower in mercury, like canned light tuna. Still, there's one place in the world where the public's appetite for tuna is practically insatiable, where the devotion to tuna has turned its consumption into a multi-billion dollar global business. Tuna has no trouble crossing demographic lines. You can enjoy an inexpensive tuna sandwich or plunk down $75 for a single slice of tuna at a high-end sushi bar. And at this Japanese fish market, you'll find some of the priciest tuna in the world. No place sells more fish than the Tsukiji market in Tokyo. Four billion dollars annually flows through the market. It is 52 acres of every conceivable creature that could possibly live in the sea. They sell clams, crabs, oysters, scallops, mussels, every conceivable kind of fish, seaweed, fish eggs, everything. But the major attraction, if you will, at the Skiji fish market are the tuna auctions. Six days a week, in several rooms the size of high school gymnasiums, an estimated 1,000 giant bluefin are auctioned off. The fish arrive in Japan from oceans around the world, often within 24 hours of being caught. Some come packed in ice. Others have been flash frozen aboard ship. More and more fish come here. So their prices are determined here. And now it is especially so with more than 100 countries exporting to Tsukiji. The Japanese believe that the most wonderful food item you can possibly consume is the belly meat of a bluefin tuna, the red fatty meat of a bluefin tuna. It commands extraordinary prices in Japan. It commands extraordinary prices elsewhere. That belly meat, known as toro, is the most expensive part of the tuna. Used for sushi and sashimi, it has made bluefin the most sought after of all tunas. Buyers for the top sushi chefs in the world begin arriving at 4 a.m to inspect the bluefin that are on display. They roll the tuna on their side, looking in the belly. The color of the meat indicates the fat content. The fattier, the better. The buyers use flashlights to examine the meat. They also rub small pieces between their thumb and forefingers to get a sense of the oil content. We take a look at the part of the fish and imagine what the rest would be like. If the flesh is smooth, if it has lots of fat on the flesh, if it keeps the fresh color for a long time, these are the things we look at. Tsunanori Ida has been buying bluefin tuna for nearly half a century. His family has been in the business for seven generations. The auctioneer and buyers have a sign language all their own. Well, this is 1,000 yen, or 10,000 yen, or 100,000 yen per kilo. When you have your palm outwards, that means selling, and your palm inwards is to buy. A single bluefin generally sells from anywhere between $2,000 and $20,000. In 2001, a bluefin was auctioned at Tsukiji for the all-time record, $173,600. Tsunanori Ida buys tuna from more than 450 establishments in Japan. 
Tuna is the main dish for sushi restaurants, which means they cannot go without it, no matter what happens. You cannot say, sorry, we don't have tuna today. That would be taboo. While the fatty belly meat is used for toro, the rest of the fish is sliced and sold as cheaper cuts. In Japan, even the least expensive sushi, available in strip malls and grocery stores, is made from bluefin. But in America, we don't eat that much bluefin tuna. The tuna you get in sushi and sashimi and tuna steaks and tuna carpaccio in America is usually yellowfin or big eye tuna. The Japanese aren't the first to discover the virtues of bluefin tuna. In ancient Rome, soldiers marched into battle with their kit bags and stomachs filled with dried bluefin tuna. 2,000 years later, big game fishermen such as authors Zane Gray and Ernest Hemingway discovered the thrill of the hunt. This is the beginning of sport fishing. The tuna was probably the first fish caught as a sport fish, because prior to that, people had caught fish that they were going to eat. At the turn of the 20th century, the bluefin's fatty red meat was deemed inedible. Many sport fishermen would actually pay to have the bluefin's worthless carcass carted away after posing for photographs. Oh, there we go. Oh, I got you. I doesn't feel big. Sport fishing obviously didn't do the tuna population that much harm, but what happened over time is, first of all, people started eating bluefin tuna, and then commercial fishermen figured out a way to catch them in very large numbers. It's only within the past 30 years that the demand for bluefin tuna has reached staggering heights. There are countries throughout the Mediterranean, in fact, every country in the Mediterranean has a tuna fishery, and the tuna are caught at a young age, they're persinged, they're put in uh, pens, they're fed until they are adult size, and then they're killed, and virtually all of them shipped to Japan. This all-out assault upon the bluefin has led to dire consequences. This method of fishing has one serious problem, and that is if you catch half-grown tuna, you're catching the tuna before they are old enough to breed. And if you catch the breeding population and remove it, you're not going to get much in the way of reproduction if there's no fish left to breed. Tuna require specific conditions in order to breed, and won't do it here. So what has happened to the Mediterranean tuna population, it has crashed. Fundamentally, bluefin tuna are just too valuable for their own good. Eat up, eat up. Whenever a fish is worth $100,000 or more, a single animal, I think it's fair to say we're going to see enormous pressure to fish that species right down to commercial extinction. And that is what's happened with bluefin tuna. International fishing quotas have been largely ignored, as have laws outlawing the use of spotter planes. The situation has become so dire that even this veteran fish buyer acknowledges the problem. In my opinion, we should limit our catch to about 50% all over the world. If we care about our children and their children, that's something we have to do. Bluefin tuna are the, one of the poster children for overfishing. The population of bluefin tuna has declined by more than 90% in the last several decades. The animal really has its back against the wall. Some experts warn that at the rate we're fishing bluefin tuna, the species may be extinct within a decade. But the bluefin has friends, too. Got it. Got it. People are working to help the largest and fastest of all tunas. It's a race with a bluefin survival as the prize. With the all too real threat that the bluefin tuna may one day become extinct, people are fighting back. Dr. Barbara Block and a dedicated team of scientists in Monterey, California have been at the forefront. Here at the Tuna Research and Conservation Center, we have tunas in captivity, and this allows us to study how the tuna works as a machine, 
It allows us to understand better the biology of the bluefin tuna. And we're literally just opening the door to some of the basic questions of what makes this animal tick. Understanding what makes bluefin tick can mean anything from studying the amount of energy the tuna utilizes per tail beat, to finding ways of determining its sex and place of origin. The center includes an 8,000 square foot facility that houses several tanks filled with bluefins. Dr. Block and her team have pioneered the electronic tagging of marine fish species in the wild. One of the great mysteries of the open sea is where do giant tunas go? We've had a difficult time following them because they breathe with gills and that keeps them submerged. So to follow big fish in the sea, what we've done is we've taken small computers that are powered with batteries that we actually insert inside the tuna, a sensor stock comes out from the tuna, and we're able to actually map the journeys of tunas for up to five years. Every year for the past decade and a half, Dr. Block and a team of scientists and fishers have taken to the Atlantic and Pacific in the name of science. Through their Tag a Giant Foundation, the team has caught and tagged more than a thousand bluefin tuna. They use two different types of tags. The first, known as archival tags, are implanted in the abdomens of the tuna and programmed to record data at set intervals. Sensors on the body of the tag record the depth and internal body temperature of the tuna, while sensors on the stalk record water temperature and light levels. We're able to actually measure the sunrise and sunset every day while the tuna is swimming around. And just like sailors traveling across the seas, we're actually using astronomical math in combination with an accurate sea surface temperature to position the animal on the planet Earth. The main limitation of the archival tags is that in order to retrieve the data, the fish must be caught, and the fisher must return the tag to the center. A $1,000 reward is offered to anyone returning a tag from the Atlantic. A $500 reward is offered for each tag retrieved from the Pacific. To date, archival tags have been returned from more than 20 different countries. The second type of tag, the pop-up satellite tag, records data similar to the archival tag. But its findings are accessible even if the fish isn't caught. Researchers secure the satellite tag to the back of the fish with a dart. At a pre-programmed time, anywhere from 30 days up to a year, an electrical impulse corrodes the wire that attaches the dart to the tag, and the tag releases from the fish. It then floats to the surface and uploads the log data to a satellite. With this tag, we're almost taking back the mystery from the sea. We're finding out where the major corridors are, where the major deserts are, and how the animals pass through them, where they come and congregate, where are the hot spots, and where are the places that are the equivalent of watering holes on the African savanna. Dr. Block's research has already yielded some startling results. She's discovered two distinct populations of Atlantic bluefin tuna, both of which swim incredible distances. During much of the year, the populations will intermingle, feeding together across a broad swath of the Atlantic. But at certain times during the spring and summer months, mature fish will return to their native spawning grounds, either in the Mediterranean or the Gulf of Mexico. So if we have high quotas, for example, over in the European side of the fishery and very low quotas on the North American side of the fishery, because the populations mix, we're finding that we have to work as common nations across the North Atlantic to actually protect the remaining resource. Thanks to the good work of our scientists here at the uh, Tuna Research and Conservation Center, we know a lot more about where these animals go. We have the knowledge we need to manage them better. Now we just need to have the courage to put that knowledge to work. It may take more than courage. In 2008, the World Wildlife Foundation called for a complete halt to bluefin fishing in the Mediterranean. Instead, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT, voted to approve quotas far in excess of those recommended by their own scientists. 
and so it's overfishing as usual. That's just got to stop, or we're going to lose this species on our watch. But if some Australian entrepreneurs have their way, there will be a bright future for the bluefin tuna and other tuna species as well. What happens if we fish the mighty bluefin to extinction? We learned a long time ago that taking out the big predators, the top predators in an ecosystem, isn't particularly wise. We are fundamentally altering ocean ecosystems by removing the top predators. It's called fishing down the food chain. If we continue along that line, pretty soon the catch of the day is going to be jellyfish, not bluefin tuna. Some see hope for the bluefin and other tuna species in a modified version of the very process that is helping decimate their numbers, the large-scale domestication of the ocean. If you think about the land for a moment, we stopped hunting wild animals for, on land for the market 100 years ago. Everything on land that we eat today is farmed. Very little, if anything, comes from the wild. We still market hunt wild animals for food in the oceans, but we at least ought to do it on a sustainable basis. And that's been problematic, particularly for species like bluefin tuna. So the future of seafood, it seems certain, is fish farming or aquaculture. Aquaculture now accounts for 40% of the world's fish consumption. And tuna farms have sprung up in such diverse places as the Mediterranean, Mexico, and South Australia. A tuna farm is essentially a feedlot in the ocean, where tuna are taken from the wild, fattened in pens, slaughtered and sold. Due to the tuna's enormous appetites, it takes approximately 16 pounds of food to add one pound to each tuna. But if there's no tuna to take from the ocean, the enterprise and the species fails. So the holy grail of tuna farming becomes raising them from eggs. No one has perfected a method of raising bluefin that way, but progress is being made, especially here in South Australia. At Clean Seas Tuna Limited, Chairman Hagen Steer has spent several years trying to breed bluefin tuna in captivity. I heard about the propagation of fish. I seen propagation of other fish uh, when uh, scientists were talking about it. And that's when we thought, is it maybe, just maybe, by a weird chance, we can close the life cycle of bluefin tuna. Hagen has more than 20 years' experience farming bluefin in Australia and the Mediterranean. His desire to ensure the tuna's future is rooted in mistakes made in the past. We became greedy. We went to the Mediterranean, and we were so arrogant. Unfortunately, everyone went tuna farming, and there just isn't any tuna around. Now, if I look five or 10 years ahead, uh, that might not be possible anymore in Australia either, that we catch fish at, uh, at sea. So the next thing is propagation. Clean Seas has already achieved success in breeding two other species of fish, kingfish and mullaway. The numbers are staggering. Clean Seas produces more than 4,000 tons of aquaculture bred kingfish and mullaway annually. Now they've turned their attention to tuna. In 2005, they constructed this tightly guarded hatchery in a remote Australian town at a cost of $18 million. The facility's main feature is a 790,000 gallon tank, painstakingly designed to replicate the optimum conditions for spawning. Controls are so stringent, even our cameras had to shoot at a distance. What we're trying to do for the tuna is um... You could say we're trying to bring the ocean onto the to land and bring the fish with it, so the tuna on land, so we can produce tuna in an on-land facility. Using computers, scientists can make the tank brighter or darker, approximating the movement of the sun. They can also conform the water temperature to the temperatures of the oceans where the tuna breed. It's what you call manipulation of the fish, so you are trying to tell the fish what time of year it is, and should it be spawning, or should it be cruising, or should it just be eating? In 2008, 
16 sexually mature male and female bluefin were airlifted into the hatchery via helicopter. Four underwater cameras began capturing their every move. This is the laboratory for the CST breeding facility for the tuna, southern bluefin tuna. This is where we monitor the fish, um, a camera system that allows us to look at the behaviour of the fish, how they're reacting throughout the day, after feeding, during courtship, as the sun comes up in the morning, as the lights go down in the afternoon for them. Within weeks of arrival, several pairs began exhibiting courtship behaviour. You can see it's quite active, the behaviour here. The male will align himself just behind the female's vent and he's waiting for her to release eggs. So he's loaded with sperm and as soon as any eggs are released, he's ready to, to release the sperm over the top of it. The behaviour continued for months with no tangible results. We'd been monitoring for the past kind of three months, looking for eggs, looking for eggs, and nothing. Yet we had all this courtship behavior. Then, a breakthrough. You can see sperm released as a white pup in this rare Clean Seas video. And then sure enough, we came up in the morning, had a look, and there they were. We had eggs in the tank, and it was just amazing for us. It was, you know, a huge accomplishment for the whole team that was involved. We have been able to re recuperate those eggs, which is also um, was a, a technical feat because it's a big tank. And we have been able to collect them, clean the eggs, incubate them, and hatch the eggs, and actually have bluefin larvae on site. Clean Seas managed to keep the larvae alive for five days. They've now joined forces with a team of scientists from Japan and are convinced they can take the process to the next level. It, the best is yet to come. We haven't even started yet. We will give the world southern bluefin tuna. It's a foregone conclusion. If Clean Seas succeeds in raising bluefin to market size, the sky, or the sea, is the limit, not only for the bluefin, but for the other tuna species as well. In the meantime, experts urge consumers to take a more active role in choosing the tuna they purchase. Tunas are ubiquitous. They're all over the world, many, many species of tunas. Some, like the bluefin tuna, are in real trouble. But bluefin tuna is not what we eat in a tuna sandwich. Typical tuna sandwich are other species like skipjack and yellowfin, which are in much better shape. We would recommend a pole caught or troll caught US West Coast or British Columbia albacore. Uh, very well managed. Uh, the catch methodology doesn't have a lot of bycatch. And so if I was going to make a, an immediate recommendation, that's what I would do. People should ask their restaurateurs, they should ask their retailers, what kind of fish am I dealing with here? What kind of fish am I buying? Tuna has been part of our diet since ancient times. How this magnificently designed fish fares in the future is clearly in our hands. It's hope that through science, consumer awareness, and international cooperation. All tuna species will remain healthy and vibrant for millennia.